My name is Lin Jiang. Uh, I'm Vice President of the Energy Foundation and the Director of the China Sustainable Energy Program. Um, for many years, I was a, a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, working with Mark on uh, energy issues in China. So today we have a, a interesting session coming up at the last session, uh, session for today. And I have to admit, I'm not so creative, creative to create such a title called Cycles, Predictions, and Policies. Uh, I couldn't really make uh, a lot of sense out of that. But I assume people are very much interested in hearing about the growth in energy and CO2 emissions in China. So hopefully we'll get to hear some of that from our panelists. Today we have uh, four distinguished panelists. And the first one is Professor Alfhammer. Uh, he's a professor of agricultural resource economics on campus. He's been studying energy use and CO2 emissions in China for the last four or five years. And so let's hear what he has to, to say on that subject. I think this is the one. And I just stand here? OK. Easy. And don't move around too much for the video camera. OK, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's late in the afternoon, so I'll try and be brief and entertaining at the same time. Uh, I work, I'm an economist, and I work on forecasting uh, CO2 emissions mainly using statistical techniques. So many of my fellow panelists here have tremendous amounts of institutional knowledge, and, and I'm a little bit short on that sometimes, so I, I work more on the statistical side of things. So what I figure is I'd give you an, an overview a little bit of China's new role as the leading emitter of CO2 emissions and then talk a little bit about uh, global climate policy with some hopefully uh, new and interesting ideas. So the title of this whole workshop was uh, what we know and what we, what we don't know or what we're trying to find out. I, I misquoted already. But what we do know or what we think we know is that China overtook the US as the leading emitter of fossil fuel related carbon dioxide fairly recently. So at the end of 2006 are the most recent estimates this happened. This was a, a position that the US has held since 1890, so a, a quite significant leadership change here. However, what happened is if we turn around and sort of sum up the stock of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, since the stuff stays up there for about 150 years, uh, between the US, the EU, and Russia, uh, these three players are responsible for 63% uh, of the stock, and this is only figures up to 2003. China and India combined are, well, if you take away the rounding error, for about 10% of the stock of, of emissions, which creates this issue that uh, most of the effects that we see or we're going to see come from historical emissions from countries that are not China. So what do we not know? Well, we don't know the future. Life would be very easy if we knew the future, and I would be out of a job being a forecaster. So what we don't know are what are future emissions trajectories of carbon dioxide going to be, not just one or two years out, but 10 years out, 50 years out, or 100 years out, which is certainly a, a quite tremendous challenge. The other thing we don't know, Kyoto is going to expire uh, fairly soon, and we're not quite sure what the next round of climate policy is going to look like. What you certainly saw if you looked at the, at the news recently, people are, are renegotiating for the next climate agreement. But what, what we're really asking ourselves all over again, what types of policy instruments are the, the efficient ones that we should be adopting? And I think more importantly in this debate is which ones of these possible policy instruments, may they be taxes or tradable permits or something like that, are equitable or fair? The, the million dollar or, or more likely a billion or potentially trillion dollar question is the one, how do we engage, and by we I mean the, the sort of Kyoto Annex 1 countries, the developing countries in order to uh, deviate from the business as usual trajectory that's uh, in, in the right direction, obviously. So what I'm going to do over the next sort of 10 minutes is show you some trajectories where we potentially thought emissions were going to go at important points in the past and then show you sort of my best guess of where I think they're going to go and then give you an outline of a, a potential new climate treaty that, that people haven't been talking about very much. So uh, I'll throw in my five cents into the debate. So 
if we go back and we look at historical forecasts of, of CO2 emissions, uh, you look in the literature and there's certainly lots of them around, but in order to come up with a consistent set of forecasts that gets us what did we expect future emissions to be like in the early 90s, mid 90s, or now, uh, what I did all day today is trying to come up with some forecasts uh, at important points in time. So what I used is this IPAD identity, which is uh, spread throughout the literature. If you open the United Nations IPCC's uh, special report on emission scenarios, it's stated in there basically almost like this, where we think that emissions or impact are a function of population, per capita wealth, and technology, meaning how efficient we are at burning, uh, burning fuels. So what I did in the next, for the next couple of slides is, at each point in time, I predicted what affluence or per capita GDP is by simply assuming that it would grow over the uh, indefinite future uh, at the same rate it was growing over the previous five years from the point the forecasts were made. For technology, I looked at carbon intensity of, country level, uh, of countries. Again, at a point in time, calculated the, uh, the growth rate of carbon intensity over the past five years and then assumed that that would continue uh, indefinitely. For population forecasts, I used the US Census Bureau's uh, population forecasts. So what on earth do I mean by uh, important points in time? Well, if you care about CO2 emissions, the big date was 1992, the Rio Earth Summit. And what you're seeing here is a pie chart. It's an imperfect pie chart, and it's more supposed to be qualitative, qualitative than actually putting a, a lot of weight, whether this 15 is a 15 or really a 13. But what we did here is forecast 2010 emissions using this very simple framework that I just showed you using 1992 data. So using historical growth up to 1992 from 1987 on, trying to predict what, 19, uh, what 2010 emissions were. So this is the distribution where you see the US in 2010 roughly being responsible for 20%, China about 15%, uh, the EMU, European Monetary Union, about 10%. If we then uh, flip this forward, to the next important date, if you're interested in carbon policy, the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, what we see is that the share of the pie of 2010 anticipated emissions by the US grew quite drastically. Let me go back again one slide. Uh, sorry, back again one slide. So you see US at 19% and here you see the pie growing drastically. China's share of the pie staying roughly constant. So this may be a, a partial, not explanation clearly, but some indication why potentially the US didn't ratify uh, Kyoto. If we, well, I know, it's, it's, I have 15 minutes. So if you give me two hours, we, we could talk about this more. But uh, if we then go on to today, meaning 2004, which is the most recent set of emissions uh, data we have at the national level, what you see over the, the tremendous growth in emissions and GDP over the past five years, what we're seeing is that China's share of the, the pie here has grown just absolutely tremendously. So what that leads me to believe, this, this talks about distribution, I went back to the literature and looked at what do people currently think emissions of the, the People's Republic of China are going to be out to 2010. So I tried to compare what our expectations of emissions are across different studies. The first one you see up there is the IPCC, that's the UN's branch. Uh, this is for Asia, so I tried to scale it a little bit, but the range of annual growth rates from uh, best scenario to worst case scenario is somewhere between two and 5%. Uh, there are a couple of other studies that, that have been done fairly recently that all are in this ballpark of four to 5%. An older study by Young and, and Steve Schneider in 1998 had uh, lower growth rates, 2 to 3 percent, and a recent paper by myself and Richard Carson, who's, who's also here, uh, which uses data up until 2004, puts anticipated per year growth rates at somewhere near 11 to 12 percent. Now, what does this mean? In some sense, they're all just lines in the sand because we're predicting the future here. But the observed growth rate from 2000 to 2004 annually is roughly 11%. And the growth rate for the last year that we have data for from 2003 to 2004 is somewhere near, near 18%. So the point I'm trying to make here, I don't want to come across as the economist pointing fingers by any means. All I'm saying here is as we're trying to develop forecasts of future uh, emissions trajectories, 
the official forecasts by which we're forcing all of these climate models to calculate impacts off of, which are the IPCC SRES scenarios, are potentially very far off from where the, the current trajectory is, is going. So this is fairly uh, uh, dire. So, so let's turn to some, some climate policy discussion here. So there's well-documented um, evidence that the US failed to find a way to get a, a global, really stringent climate agreement. So Kyoto, by many, is seen as weak and ineffective. Again, we would have to take a long time to, to debate why this is. But emissions reductions from Annex 1 countries are, are not very large compared to the growth in emissions um, across the board from countries who are not cutting back emissions. The basic issue here is that cutting back emissions relative to 1990 emissions levels doesn't work very well for countries whose population and per capita in uh, incomes are growing rapidly. Uh, two of these countries happen to be the number uh, one and two emitter of CO2 today, which is the United States and, and China, neither of which are subject to binding cutbacks under, under Kyoto. Now, the idea in this, in this op-ed, which is eventually going to be a paper, is there is the potential uh, that it could be in China's best self-interest to adopt a sizable carbon tax, and most importantly, the, the thing that comes after the end here is crucial, and push for other countries to do the same thing and use this as a base of, basis for a feasible and hopefully effective climate agreement. Now let me back this up with why I think, or why we think this is, this is a, a useful way of thinking about climate policy. A carbon tax makes fossil fuels more expensive, carbon-containing fossil fuels, which they all do. So what it, what it does, by making fuel, fuels more expensive, it shifts energy infrastructure towards being more energy efficient. What you do here is, by increasing this car, or imposing this carbon tax, you sacrifice some short-term growth by investing in more energy efficient capital that you're trading off for potentially longer, more sustainable growth. In addition, what this would do is, if other countries adopt this carbon tax as well, it would help China develop an export market for these products, these more energy efficient products. And by that, I don't necessarily mean technologies that are on the drawing board or we don't know how to develop yet, but existing technologies that could be produced at a significantly lower cost. The nice thing about a carbon tax is it's administratively very easy to collect. Uh, you can collect it very, very far uh, upstream, avoiding the necessity to collect it at each household or each firm. In addition, you can take a carbon tax and you can make it revenue neutral by taking the revenue uh, gained from that carbon tax and redistributing it uh, in form of rebated fees that you, you otherwise charge or offsetting other taxes. Last slide, because I must be out of my, the two minute sign is up, perfect. Okay, so why is a carbon tax nice? As an economist, what we would like to tax are things that, that have an externality. So things that impose external costs on society, if we charge a tax, we can move towards a more efficient outcome. Versus charging things like income, move us away from a socially uh, efficient outcome. So a carbon tax, in some sense, is a much nicer thing to adopt than an income tax. A secondary benefit of a carbon tax would, especially in the case of China, not so much in the case of the US, by increasing the cost of these fossil fuels, it would potentially result, depending on the size of this carbon tax, in significant reduction in air pollution in China's cities, which, as you all know, has tremendous health costs associated with it. Uh, another point here, why China? Well, energy efficiency in China is much less than that of European countries. Uh, Europe is also a European country, I guess. Japan, China. And what this means is uh, the Chinese could cut back fossil fuel uh, consumption at the margin at a much lower cost than these, these competitors. So the most significant gain from a carbon tax adopted by China clearly does not, not come from a unilateral adoption of a carbon tax. What this would be is it would be a negotiated carbon tax where the world comes together or parties to the Kyoto Protocol come together, negotiate a carbon tax, and then agree to enforce this carbon tax. And the idea here is to force compliance to this carbon tax 
by linking this to trade, by imposing an import tariff on goods imported from countries that do not comply in the amount of the carbon tax, which would put it in the best interest of these countries to adopt the carbon tax, because otherwise they would forego the, uh, the tax revenue uh, instead of paying these tariffs. So I thank you. I think I'm, I'm on time, and I will pass this on to the next presenter. Thank you, Max. You're actually ahead of time. I think economists like to think of themselves to be efficient. Uh, so that's a very interesting idea that a larger carbon tax in China and globally can lead to a growing benefit to China. Next, we have Mark Levine. Uh, Mark, uh, until very recently, is the director of Energy uh, Technology Division at the Lawrence Brooklyn National Lab. But more relevant to today's discussion, he is really the pioneer in collaboration with China in terms of energy efficiency policies. Starting 1988, Mark has started a group called China Energy Group at the lab that works extensively with uh, Chinese institutions, both inside and outside of government, to promote energy efficiency policies. And he has a great perspective to share with us how the evolution of the Chinese energy system uh, evolved over the last 25 years. Mark. Thank you, Zhang. Thank you for the organizers of this conference. It's a wonderful group of people. And let me start this talk. Can China gain control of its energy future? Uh, this is a rhetorical question. I'm not sure I'm going to give you an answer to it. Uh, I, I want to describe the past, uh, 1980 to 2000. Uh, and I want to use that to explain uh, a comment that Max made about the fact that China has put up a relatively small amount of CO2 because of the policies and programs uh, during that period, uh, China put up way less CO2 into the atmosphere than anybody would have expected a developing country in rapid development uh, to do. Unfortunately, in the period 2001 to the present, uh, uh, that has changed, uh, and I want to understand why it's changed, see if I can explain that, because I think that's a key to understanding what might be done uh, in the future. By the way, I might say I liked Max's proposal. Uh, I think the biggest issue, well, there are a number of issues. How do you convince the whole world to do something like that? Uh, you know, that would take a little bit of work. Uh, and then on the Chinese side, because Chinese energy is so carbon intensive, uh, because they use so much coal, uh, the Chinese will argue that a carbon tax will disadvantage them. And so there needs to be uh, some discussion of that. But I, I do find Chinese policymakers open to the notion of carbon taxes, and they never used to be. So they're, they're really open to uh, any ideas. Okay, so uh, from 1949 to 1979, uh, China really followed the Soviet Union's uh, approach of energy was uh, too cheap to meter, don't worry about the environment, let it grow as fast as possible. Energy uh, was meant to underpin uh, heavy industrial growth. And so the red, the red line shows you the estimate of GDP, uh, and this is energy. And you can see that energy grew roughly twice as fast as GDP over this period. So this is the Russian model. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, made major changes at the recommendation of a group of academic energy experts. Uh, a group of roughly 100 got together, wrote a huge report, went to see him, and told him that Chinese policies were wrong on energy. Uh, that took a lot of courage at that time, because uh, you could debate policies before they were uh, promulgated, but after they were established, they weren't wrong. Uh, well, Deng listened and he listened very quickly. Uh, they uh, uh, pushed on energy price reform. It was hard to do. They did a little bit of it. 
and they did a lot of energy efficiency, and they did it fast. Uh, they, uh, they put in place new institutions of government, the Energy Conservation Investment Corporation, uh, a department in, uh, well, what is now in the RC, but its forerunners that was responsible for energy conservation. Uh, they required uh, energy consumption managers for all key industries. They had quotas on industries. They gave rewards based on performance of industries, uh, financial incentives. They developed very, very quickly uh, a large uh, investment program uh, for energy efficiency. I think it's the first country in the world that had a government-sponsored uh, energy efficiency investment program. Uh, you need to remember that at this time, they were separated from the rest of the world. There was very little discussion. Uh, indeed, when I first went to China in 1988, the major reason I got involved is that uh, I met people uh, who were concerned about energy efficiency, involved in it, and I was the first person outside of China that they had ever met who worked on energy efficiency. Uh, China uh, funded a national network of energy conservation centers, uh, uh, either technical or supervision centers. They had Energy Conservation uh, Week, and they did this virtually overnight. Uh, the result was uh, the, um, this is the, the uh, macroeconomic result, and, and that is here is the economy, and here's energy. And you can see that energy grew at uh, probably 30% of, of GDP, uh, rather than faster than GDP. Remarkable turnaround. I need also to call your attention, uh, a remarkable turnaround, let me say another word or two about that. Uh, I didn't believe it when I first saw it, which is one of the reasons why I kept going back to China for a while to, uh, and brought Chinese here to uh, uh, validate the number, which I did believe after we had talked to the data people. Uh, although we just made a guess on what GDP should have been, I don't know. We cut it, we cut it back, maybe more than we should have. Um, but, uh, uh, there was virtually no other developing country in the world at that time that was able to achieve over any substantial period of time an energy growth that was lower, lower than GDP. Uh, and China being a huge place, the idea that they could have done it uh, was just staggering to me. Uh, now I need to note another thing about this which is also staggering. You note uh, from 1997 to uh, 2000, that energy uh, declines. Uh, in fact, that's not a small decline, that's 300 million tons of coal uh, in that period of time. Uh, well, those data are not correct. Uh, they have since been modified. Uh, I remember when I uh, saw them, I went to the National Bureau of Statistics and I said, uh, um, I know there are a lot of small coal mines that are being closed. I said, um, uh, but I also know that they're not really being closed. How do you count the coal? And, and, and I, the answer was, they're closed. <laughs> there is no coal. And I said, well, do you really think they're closed? He said, no. I said, <laughs> I said, in that case, uh, shouldn't you count the call? He said, no, <laughs> you can't do that. So uh, it's been a long period of adjusting these numbers, and it's really only in the last year that they've been adjusted. I, I meant to bring another chart that showed the new numbers, but basically uh, it's, it's flat for some years. And it does give us some greater confidence in numbers later. Now, why did that happen? Uh, it really happened because it was in the mid-90s, mid to late 90s, that China uh, went uh, very 
strongly toward a market economy uh, uh, in many areas. And they simply decided that you don't need so much data if you have a market taking care of everything. And they, they essentially disbanded major parts of their data system in energy. Uh, now they presently realize that that was a huge mistake, but at the time, you know, they didn't. Uh, and uh, so they had very bad data, and that's, and, and, and actually they had a, a very, very good data system for energy uh, as compared with most other countries uh, before they did that. Uh, so I think that's pretty pertinent to this, to this conference. I, I told you that uh, energy conservation investment uh, went up. It went up very fast, uh, and it became uh, 12 percent of total energy investment, the red, the red line, uh, by 1981. And they just started the program uh, in 1980. Uh, now, I think this is money allocated that may not all have been spent uh, in that year, but uh, they moved very fast. Uh, now, here you see China's CO2 emissions, and uh, my comment at the time, and this is, this is old, uh, is that China would have way surpassed the U.S. if they had not done so much energy efficiency. But you see, this ends in 1997 before things changed. Uh, and now things have changed. Uh, and uh, here we see, well, let's look at this. Uh, from 2001 to 2005, uh, uh, we see GDP growing fast. Uh, we see energy growing faster. Uh, and you also see the energy target. The target was the same one the Chinese had had between 1980 and 2000. Uh, and that was uh, for energy to grow half as fast as GDP. How am I doing on time? Am I in bad shape? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so uh, their, their goal was to have GDP quadruple. It's growing at a faster rate than that, uh, and energy use double. Uh, and here you can see that uh, uh, the energy growth really is way off the target, uh, that being the, the national target. Uh, and uh, energy is just growing out of sight. The last two years, China has added 100 gigawatts of uh, power plants a year, a large part of which is coal-fired power plants. Uh, what do I compare that with? Well, the total capacity in the U.S. must be around 900 gigawatts, roughly. So, I haven't looked recently. So, China is adding one-ninth of a U.S. every year. And the years before the last two, they were adding uh, somewhere between 70 and, and, and 80 gigawatts per year. So it's staggering growth uh, in coal-based power plants. Uh, now, in terms of CO2 emissions, it is very important to point out that China uh, uh, is not responsible for the, the stock of uh, CO2 emissions in, in the atmosphere that we have uh, been the and will be the world leader in that uh, for a long, long time. Uh, now, it was not many years ago that the prediction was that China would overtake us in energy-related CO2 emissions by 2020. Uh, most of the forecasts three years ago said that. Uh, that's because forecasts are kind of slow in adapting to recent things unless you're max and you take the most recent results and use them for your forecasts. Uh, uh, our calculations suggest that they've actually overtaken us this year. Uh, and the Dutch seem to have the same results. Our calculations are based on uh, uh, very careful assessment of NBS data and U.S. data. Okay. 
So, what is causing this? Well, uh, industry is the big factor in China. Uh, interestingly, most of the industrial sectors, the heavy industry, has seen a continued uh, improvement in energy efficiency. That's worth repeating. During this period of time, industry in China has seen uh, an improvement in energy efficiency. However, uh, what's happened is the growth rate of industrial output in energy efficiency is like it was when China was following the Russian model. It's enormous, except this is now a capitalist model where people who do cement make a fortune because of the need for infrastructure. People who do iron and steel make a fortune because of the need for infrastructure. So uh, on this chart here, uh, the forecast for iron and steel in the year 2000 was 170 million metric tons, okay? Uh, well, four years later, it was 270 million metric tons. I mean, it's astounding, okay? Cement production, the forecast in 2000 was for 750 uh, million metric tons in 2004. The actual number was 950 million metric tons. So that's the biggest thing that's going on in China. Uh, will it go on indefinitely? Well, no, it won't. I mean, as soon as the infrastructure catches up, then people aren't going to make uh, a huge amount of money on this. Have to finish. Uh, but when is the infrastructure going to catch up? Don't know. So last comment, uh, uh, the Chinese government has instituted the program of 20% uh, reduction in energy intensity in five years. Uh, and they're very, very serious about that, this. It was initiated by the Communist Party. It's been supported at all levels. One of their major uh, techniques uh, is to uh, penalize people, uh, cost people jobs if they don't meet the target, uh, or cost them promotions, uh, or cost them uh, salary. And one of the big problems we heard from uh, Ye Chi is uh, uh, whether the data will support it. Uh, because at the lower levels, as he has said, uh, data aren't reported very accurately, particularly when there's a powerful incentive not to provide data that's going to cost you your job. So it's a difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next, we have Professor Larry Lee. Professor Lee is a professor of ecology and director of International Center for Ecology and Sustainability at UC Riverside. Among many honorary titles he held, he's a fellow of Institute of Human Ecology and honorary professor of Russian Academy of Science and a fellow of American Association of Advancement of Science. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, agricultural pollutions in China. Thank you. Um, since the, our uh, last section panel talked about the rural area and the related environmental health uh, the issues, um, my talk is to emphasize the agriculture non-point pollution issues. Um, as you know, the, uh, during the, in our uh, like United States and Europe, uh, basically developed country uh, in the 1960s already recognized non-point pollution issues are very significant issues and uh, have been passing the serious law and uh, legislation uh, to control this. Uh, for example, we have the uh, Clean Water Act in 1972, and uh, in the middle of 1990s, we have what's so-called a Coast Zone Act reauthorization amendment. Uh, and also in the Europe, they have the Water Framework Directive uh, in the 2000, and also what they call the best management practice uh, in Europe also adopted uh, you know, recently. And uh, uh, 
for example, the German passed the new environmental law in 2003. Uh, those all is recognized that non-point pollution becomes a significant issue uh, compared to previously, you know, the have certain the location, the kind of pollution that's easy for uh, anyone to check, anyone to look at, anyone to monitor it. Uh, for the non-point pollution, the issue is quite complicated and difficult. Uh, as many people know, uh, recent the, in China, like tai, Taihu Lake, the issue is also related directly with the uh, non-point agriculture pollution, of course, some of other as well. Uh, if you are uh, aware about the uh, report uh, released early this year by the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, the UN, the one of the organization, uh, they consider agriculture pollution, which means that not just agriculture ruler uh, farming practice also uh, uh, including those uh, uh, livestock uh, uh, production altogether. Uh, if they convert to the carbon uh, equivalent unit, that's actually uh, more than the, all the transportation combined. So basically that is very significant issues and uh, uh, many people already uh, be recognized. And uh, recently, we also analyzed the, the China data, uh, working with the East China Normal University, uh, just accepted right now, already published online in International Journal, called Environmental Pollution. It specifically analyzed the Shanghai area, considered urban, suburban, and rural area. So actually, urban and the suburban area, the environmental situation, if according what we developed, the integrated pollution index the measurement is improved. But however, the rural area become much more greater uh, contribution to those the pollutions. Uh, so that's all, all the point to the agriculture and the rural pollution become more and more important uh, issue in China. Uh, and also the situation uh, even more uh, serious is that in term, uh, looking into the China situation about the use of the fertilizer and the pesticide. Um, for example, use the nitrogen uh, as an example. Uh, in China, basically, is uh, during the last 10, 20 years, more than 10, 20 years, the fertilizer use is increased significantly. And that's not only, uh, of course, certain is the government the policy incentive to support those the, uh, fertilizer, especially small fertilizer uh, factory uh, for whatever reasons. And also the more important is that only about 50% really those the fertilizer is useful for the, for the crop uh, production. The most is not useful and wasted. And uh, uh, compare the uh, global average, uh, China used the fertilizer something around 10 times, some in the region even much higher uh, than the global average, so which means it's generating a lot of those the pollution. Um, as the greenhouse uh, gas, uh, the oxide of nitrogen, if considered that, so someone even estimated China may be contributed to global scale uh, about 25 to 30 percent of the oxide of nitrogen uh, as the, this particular uh, the greenhouse gas. Uh, so that's kind of issue is quite a, uh, significant and, and in a large scale. Um, so in China, actually, people already recognize this kind of problem, but problem is more from technology aspect that they have the available technology that can reduce that. But problem is related, I think, is more policy and the institutional level, uh, especially uh, many uh, previous panel uh, section talking about the migration, for example. Uh, thinking about a lot of people uh, go out to work in the city uh, they actually, one day's work, they can make sufficient money to buy the one big bag of fertilizer. So, of course, they are not willing to spend time and do the things to taking care of those, the uh, crop. But they're much easier for them to just buy the fertilizer and, uh, you know, themselves one weekend or whatever come and uh, just dump in the field. They just uh, 
uh, poorly uh, you know, informed the practice. But also that China, uh, after you know, reform, especially recent 10 years or 15 years, the early well-established the extension systems is totally broken. Uh, those peoples, uh, like, uh, like our in the California system, we have the extension specialist. And uh, in the county level, we have a farmer advisor and uh, some of those kind of uh, peoples, you know, helping the farmers get scientifically uh, sound information to how to manage, how to use the pesticide, how to use the fertilizer, the stuff. Uh, basically, in the California, almost for all any of the crop, or at least the commercially used the fertilizer, they have the manual or guidebook. You know, basically, you can download it or either through. Uh, our Aggie experimental station, whatever, you can get those information. But in China, they don't have. Even worse is that previously those extension specialists have now become salesperson, uh, either sales, you know, seeds or fertilizer, pesticide. So whatever they're making money, uh, basically they, they do. So that way is, is add another dimension, the complication and uh, the difficulty to solve those kind of problem. You know, traditionally uh, in China, the farmer is not responsible to deal with those pollution issues. They, what they do is, uh, you know, basically agriculture practice and activity is nothing to do you know, whatever, like water pollution or air, whatever, that's nothing to do. Traditionally, they're not thinking that way. And also from the uh, property right aspect, they also is not their business because it's the only land I have and I do whatever I want, but whatever, you know, release to the water and the air, uh, you know, air pollution issue is not my business. And also the, the economic incentive and other things also become the, uh, also the, the problem. So now, as the scientist here, I would like to uh, talk about the institutional mechanism more related with how the scientific sound knowledge uh, can be transformed or get scientifically informed policy issues. Uh, traditionally, also in China, uh, most scientists study their own little things, you know, the, Maybe also in the United States too. We also, you know, interested in some issues, and not really care what the societal impact or, or other interest. However, I believe in the environmental science, uh, environmental related issues. Those kind of scientific research has to uh, relate with the societal concern. So the question is, how are you integrating those societal concern into the uh, agenda of scientific research? and how to maintain uh, our scientific credibility. At the same time, we can develop the way to allow uh, the, all the information and the knowledge transform to certain the policy which you have uh, useful and uh, have the accessible and also can have certain the ability to feedback to allow us to find out the gap between based on our scientific research to take the action, the results, and the gap between the reality check. So the kind of a feedback loop, the stuff. So I think that's the one thing uh, I have been uh, working on that and established this International Center for Ecology and Sustainability. Uh, that's basically the, right now also part of uh, consider the UC, the 10 plus 10 alliance, the, the activities uh, with China, but also there is European component and also other country like Japan and South Korea also involved. So basically, so that's try to maintain uh, or achieve the scientifically informed policy related issues can be have certain credibility. Because a lot of time, uh, we even see today is our debating, you know, uh, that's issues. So, so a lot of time, uh, we in the West, you know, part of world scientists look at those, the data from China or data from the 
all the Chinese publications, they have a certain way to look at how credible, credible those information, like today is all the whole topic. Uh, basically, this meeting, the theme also addressed these issues. So, so then the question is, so how we can maintain or achieve the high standard, the credibility? Uh, so that's the way I think the important uh, the step we can take is through this enhanced the international collabor collaboration, uh, have a more people from the Western part of EU and the Americans come together and have to work in the same kind of issue and same interest. So then the collecting data. Uh, one thing I think, I believe the uh, Professor Chi Ye mentioned the things, uh, the data about the governor collect the data issues. I was invited to the CCTV, the Channel 2, the dialogue, the program with the Pan Yue, that's the Vice Minister of SEPA. Uh, that time I thought uh, the program have more scientists to sit there. I'd, when I got there, I've discovered that only me is scientist, so-called, then uh, all the others are government officials. And I actually don't know what kind of role I should play. So actually interview, whole dialogue, the program, we recorded three hours, but they cut it only, you know, when they're on the TV, only 45 or 50 minutes. Actually, I never watch it, but my Chinese colleague approached me and said, we don't like what you said. I said, what I said? Because I said three hours, you know, discussion, that whole thing. I don't even have a clue what I said. But I remembered the Pan Yue uh, point out, uh, one group uh, from Beijing area, uh, I think is the businessman and donated their own money creating kind of a database and a GIS-based database about uh, Beijing area, the uh, water pollution stuff. And uh, uh, Pan Yue, at least I don't know the air, I'm sure not aired to the Chinese people, the CCTV, but during the interview, of course, he know we caught it, those things, but uh, he said, I remember, the person operating the GIS and the information system better than the SEPA provide the daily information about the water pollution in, the, in the, the, the certain area. So that's mean, you know, even the SEPA, the State Environmental Protection Administration of China, you know, suppose the person should know everything. He didn't even have a clue. So consider others, of course, that's not really mean they intentionally want to hide anything or something, but basically themselves don't have the information uh, on that aspect. So I think that's the thing. We need a certain international participation, uh, like this morning talking about, you know, China, the environment issue, China's agriculture, non-point pollution issues, and not just China's issues, because we need to feed the millions, billions of people. So, doesn't matter Chinese produced or someone else, you have to, you know, to produce something. So those kind of issues, I think, is require the international collaboration, especially uh, U.S. part. I think the U.S. part is quite lacking compared to Europeans. Uh, I remember that the last time I conversation with the EU, the Environmental Protection Executive Director, they put 2.3 billion euro for China the biodiversity program, of course, the agreement is Chinese government have to one-to-one -one matching. Um, of course, that's how they did, I do not know. But that basically, you know, but U.S. basically signed all kinds of agreement, but don't have the money really touch with it. So, um, of course, energy is different issues, I think, you know, that stuff. But I think that's important we have the more international collaboration and a certain commitment from the developed country altogether to achieve our goal uh, for a sustainable future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Lee. Next, we have uh, Dr. Zhang Zhongxiang. Uh, Dr. Zhang is from the East West Center in Hawaii. Prior to that, he spent a decade in Europe teaching in two different universities. He's also on faculty at the Chinese Academy of Social Science and Peking University. Uh, Dr. Zhang has written extensively on energy growth trend and its economic impact. Um, so from his, the title of his uh, talk, 
We're going to have a very entertaining 20, uh, 15 minutes uh, next. Help me to set up my... <clears throat> Thank you very much for the chair for the kind of introductions. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I I use this demo partly because I'm still actually in the very uh, good mood of the holidays because I'm back from the almost more than one month trip to the Tokyo and the Taiwan and the mainland China and I just arrived Honolulu December third. And when I say that uh, you know the street people are starting to come to this holiday season, and I see there was people are beginning to buy the stuff and the Christmas trees. So then I thought maybe you know this is the title which I actually to some extent can reflect certain my point for the presentation. And I could can use this uh, you know the title use remark, and but I here I do give the positive uh, positive the tongues to some extent trying to release certain certain information to our other panels when they and look at these issues, and mainly particularly look at how the China and the energy saving and the pollution controls. And this, this panel, you know, basically they ask us to look at certain model issues and, and, and then is move on to the policy issues. And basically, and when you come to the, in the China engagement, the climate issues, and see China is very important, and I would say basically the two aspects. One is uh, get China involved will reduce the cost of compliance of uh, industrialized countries. And for that one, I did one study to look at that, uh, uh, you know, given the emission target from industrialized countries, and, and you can meet your target on your own, and there is no emission treating at all. That is for industrial countries themselves, they can treat it among themselves. Then you broad the scope of emission treating to including all other countries without China, then you finally including China. So then you can to distangle what exactly the China contributions. So we did these first studies, and you do say that with China and for OECD countries, the emission uh, com emission abatement cost will cut by 10% for US, will uh, will be 12% less and with China compared with without China. So this is one important aspect to get China involved. Second important aspect is means, you know, is that China is uncontrolled emission increase would offset the, the uh, emission reduction by industrial countries. And particularly when the IEA released information that China will overtake the United States uh, this year or very, or, or next year. And that is now we are starting to talk about the Kyoto Protocol, particular post-Kyoto Protocol commitment. So then the China issue, again, put on the tables. So then, then you do see from then on, actually it already has been, but now it's again, that you see is a lot of criticism in China look like it's, you know, it's, it's such kind of Christmas trees and you can hang everything on there which Christmas, Christmas China. So then question is, is really it is appropriate to do that. So for me, I try to give you look at the three from three perspective. One is look at the China energy saving efforts. The one is look at the efforts to increase renewable and clean energies. And finally, we we'll look at the China engagement in the CDM, is the clean development mechanism. And from then, I will try to look at what you could expect from China uh, in the post Kyoto negotiations. And <clears throat> first, uh, let's look at this. Uh, is the, the, the China efforts. And when the President Hu Jintao took the office and compare his predecessor, he made a pro, uh, he uh, take the building homogeneous society through the scientific development as a guiding principles. And actually this is uh, officially elevated, uh, you know, 
by revising the party constitution last, uh, last uh, October and finally you know, elevated to the level of same as Mao Zedong thought. And don't take this as granted. And as everybody who are familiar with Chinese history, you would know is that uh, Mao Zedong is a long lasting ruling head of communist parties from 1935. When the first proposal talked about the Mao Zedong thought, that was 1947, that was almost 12 years after he's really you know, he's become a leader of the, the parties. And Jiang, uh, President Hu's predecessor, Jiang Zemin, he actually took power in 1989. Then his three representatives incorporated into the party constitution that was 2002. And also 30 years when he was after his power. So he's, uh, 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 President Hu is this uh, concept of scientific de development into the party constitution only actually one term, only five years after he's in the office. And then from that time, then you see that China trying to develop a you know, plan both for long term, short term, and, and, and these guidelines. And one is, is so called is 11 five year blueprint. I would say this is a, you know, is a five year plan is a very typical thing for communist countries and socialist countries. And I see this plan have two significant difference compared to previous one. First, first difference is before they always called a plan. This is the first time is, is, it is called a blueprint. And also is a previous fire plan, they always set a mandatory growth target. And this is the first time without mandatory target, only have the guiding target. And also is the first time that they incorporate input indicator as a constraints and requires energy uh, you know, is used per unit GDP to cut by 20%. It basically means 4.4%. And also requiring re emission reduction uh, by, by 10%. Uh, don't take this, uh, 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 don't think this is too easy. If you, if you look at what happened in China, basically, now you see is uh, since 2001, actually it's only used per unit GDP increasing. So it is, this, is a, this target is not something that is, is, is a piece of cake. It actually will be very challenging. And then you see the government uh, uh, in officially incorporated this into the working report for Prime Minister 2006. Uh, uh, then it uh, made a quite a few concrete policy program to achieve this target. Uh, one is so-called the Top One South Enterprise Energy Conservation Plan. Basically, it means they pick up about 1,000 enterprise in the big energy supply and consuming sectors, and all this. Uh, uh, in, uh, enterprise would consume about one third of the energy consumption in the countries, about half of energy use in the in the total industries. Basically, if this 1,000 big industry uh, company which meet the target, then we will put China in a good shape to meet the national target. And in the transportation sector, transportation sector, China also set very stringent fuel standards. And uh, you see here, and this is based on the study done by Pew Centers, that you see that China set the standard even higher in the United States, Canada, although it's lower than Japan and the United States. And China also topped the very stringent vehicle emission standards. And basically, you know, it's uh, 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 from the uh, 2001, and, the, and China stringently increased the emission standard from Euro 1 until the July this year, we will come to Euro 3. And the big cities like Beijing, Shanghai, also take the, take the go even further. And usually they implement these standards about two years ahead of the national schedules. And, uh, and Beijing even intend to top the Euro 4 by before the uh, next year Olympic game. And another very important policy is with, which happened in the residential sector, residential sectors, government plan that is, there is a 30% increase in the efficiency in the residential sector relative to the building which built in the early 80s. And that is all new, new building how to be 50% more efficient by the 2010, has to be 65% more efficient by the 2020s. And then you see that here is a, uh, many cities actually now take this uh, efficient standard even more, more, uh, more uh, 
here is like, you know, the Tianjin, and basically you see that the, for the third step, which actually is required to be met by the 2020s, but actually it's already, ten, already uh, by year 2006, already 10% of building already meet that standards, and 15% already meet standard which is required by the 2010. And Beijing f announced that they're going to meet the third step, which means standard in 2020 by 2010, that means 10 years before the national schedules. And also on the, you know, the software emissions and the National Environmental Protection Agency and empowered by the state councils and signed the responsibility agreement with the seven professional government and the sixth top national power generation group, which basically account two thirds of SO2 emissions. And the country also had the favorable policy for the desulfurized power plant, and they will, you, they will get the premier on the, on the tariff, and if the power plant which incorporates the desulfurized uh, system, and they also given, to, you know, given the priority to connect to the grid and allow to, uh, to operate longer if they uh, operate longer than those plants which don't incorporate the desulfurized capacities. So all this policy, theory, the policies and the requirement and, and the result that the actually is the last year, the new addition of a power plant with desulfurized capacities, which are more than combined total over the last decades. And then you see what, is, what happened with all these efforts. And, then, and you do see that the, for last year, uh, is it the first time since 2003, the energy use per unit is cut by 1.3. And in the previous year, 2003, 2004, which are actually a positive increase. Although this uh, still didn't meet the national government 4%, but it is a very big achievement. And also in terms of SU2 and uh, chemical, chemical oxygen demand pollutants. And you also see that compared with previous 2005, in you know, 2006, the increase rate reduced substantially. And I see that the uh, you know, recent figure for the three, uh, last uh, uh, third quarter this year, and we do see the SU2 and the COD both have negative, uh, uh, negative growth rate for this year for, until the end of the September. And China also set a very ambitious renewable energy goals. Basically, currently 80% is from renewable and intend to be doubled by 2020. I'd just like to put the China, uh, uh, this uh, go into perspective, take the EU, this, which we consider is, uh, you know, is the one leader in the renewables uh, energy supply, which intend to have renewable supply 20% of energy, energy use. And uh, first, you know, and at first glance, you look like EU is uh, have more ambitious goal than China. But because energy demand in China grew three times faster than EU, so it have China double, double the renewable in a total energy mix, which is required that the renewable energy in China have to be four times than that of the EU. And here is a look at the, the China performance in the CDM, uh, engagement CDM, and we did a study for the Asia during back in the 1999, and that time we used a macro model to estimate that China will supply 60% of the total CDM flow in 2010. And uh, some NGO and they use this number that they call the CDM is called the China Development Mechanism. China Development Mechanism. And then you see what is happened in the reality is by the 2003, and, and Asia is far behind Latin Americans, and in the middle of 2005, then you see the India is catch up and China still far, still lag behind. Then afterwards, you see the China also grandly catch up. And by the by end of last year, then you see the 60, China is 60% of transaction which are from China. And compared with two years ago, which only 2.7% and, and, and by August this year is almost 53%. And that is, uh, no, certainly you would expect more China to do. And then the China indeed is signaling recognition of increasing importance of climate issues. And recently, uh, actually last, last month, the, the finally they have the National Environmental Protection Blueprint. Basically this kind of a line program blueprint, which is always released by the line ministerial agencies. And usually the comprehensive program are released 
by the city council. And this is the first time that this line program called the National Event Pro Protection Plan was released by city council. And they also incorporate first time that climate issue into the category of the environmental protections. And if you look at the, you know, the China commitment and look at the, what is expected from different countries, I like to uh, uh, bring this issue back. You know, in the year 2005, 2000, 2000, when they have this COP meeting in The Hague, and basically, you know, is the U.S. is always an important factor. Why CISO is, uh, you know, when in the Kyoto, when in the Kyoto and U.S. agreed to reduce uh, carbon emission by 7%, although this target is far less than what the European country asked for, but anyhow, it is, it is a commitment. It is, it is not a trivial, uh, uh, because compared with the baseline commi commitment, the U.S. probably still have to reduce by 30%. And from that time, basically, U.S. The, uh, you know, the diplomatic policy on climate issue is, uh, is called you know, divine and rule tact tactic. Basically, it's ask a few different countries, take on commitment, then push other different countries uh, to do so. And that was basically did in the COP4 in Argentina. So that time, is a huge pressure on China's side. And of course, is, uh, if you ask China to take on the absolute commitment and, and then have this national camp and treating system, that's not possible. That was a study we did in the, in the, present in the Duke. I don't have time to present here. But if you're interested, there is you know, the, uh, paper in there. And then I outlined the six proposed, uh, six options for China based on the increasing the stringencies. Basically, it started from active participant CDM for, and to undefined progress towards, to, you know, uh, that is uh, more specific policy measures, that is energy intensity or carbon intensity around or beyond 2020. That is how sector emission cap. Then finally, bottom line, that time I mentioned with the combination of a car target carbon intensity level with ambition, ambition uh, is a total cap on the particular sectors. And that is what the situation and time if you back to 2000, 2000. But if you look at what happened nowadays, the you will see is the equation probably now is stuck somewhere in the second to third options. And if you look at what is the recent indication, for the, uh, from the declaration from the high level meetings, basically an APEC meeting in September, and host Australia proposal that all oh, APEC 20, 21 countries, it doesn't matter if you're a developer or different country, agree to reduce emission intensity by 25%. But in the end, the, the agreement, uh, uh, the declaration is, means APEC wide, not the individual, APEC wide have this aspiration goal in energy intensities. To some extent, this is understandable because this is a number from IEA that you see from the 90 to 2001, uh, 1990 to 2004, IEA in country as average, efficient improvement is less than 1%. And this is all the Asia countries uh, that you see that is basically in many Asia countries actually they use energy produce per unit GDP in 2004, even more than what they used in the 1990s. And so then certainly people would expect China would do more, but I would hardly can say you can, China will not be in the position to take the lead, but anyhow would expect China will take the, uh, be the good collaborators. And one of the things I can mention is that China will, you know, is from the domestic side should make credible domestic commitment, which I mentioned three. One is, you know, is China already have very strong energy saving goals for the current five year plan. And you know, China needs to signal that we will continue to set this very challenging energy saving goal in the subsequent national plan. Another is the increasing investment in the energy conservation and improving energy efficiencies. As you also know that is, um, you know, is actually the energy investment in energy saving and, and the efficient improvement in the early 80s actually is uh, account about more than 13% of total energy saving, but until last year, that is only 3%, because with economic reform, all the decision making and resource allocation in the, to the hands of the, uh, the local government enterprise, they don't really have you know, the incentive to do so. And the government set the, set the energy conservation target, they, could, they didn't make it last year, and this year they seriously to reserve that it is almost $3.1 billion about the, about 5% of the total investment in energy sectors. 
And this is only reserved for this year, but not so sure whether it will happen the next year. So that's something I would say that uh, we do have to have this kind of energy, uh, you know, funding for a reason in, for every year and even have to be increased further. I just add one point here, which is I call it the payment of transfer. Basically, you know, when, I, uh, when the China didn't meet this emission uh, target and receiving target, I had a presentation in the Harford in the, in the March this year. At that time, I, I analyzed why that didn't meet, meet that goal. One of the reasons I said is um, when you ask the, you know, the company, how did the company to close, to eliminate that companies, you need to have to compensate one to encourage that, that kind of company because most of them, which usually in the outed Western poor regions, you need to compensate that kind of regions, particularly, you know, central government should transfer money from central to the, to the locals, that it was from central levels. In the provisional levels, they also have to, yeah, I'm finished almost. Then in the central levels, you know, in the provisional levels, they also have to transfer money to the, to the uh, you know, to the, to the county levels. So I do see, and uh, November 70th, finally I see the, finally central government made the decision that they will transfer $2 million to local government to encourage them eliminating outdated uh, production capacities. I like to end my talk by saying that here we are talking about China, but I would say is, a, is a, actually is a very important. It is the U.S. actually is a very very crucial. It is, a, you know, is a, why I say the U.S. is crucial because is up to now U.S. led some multilateral efforts, but is the U.S. has not taken lead in the global efforts. So is a, whether U.S. Uh, how to say that it is a. You know, it is, uh, as uh, Winston Churchill said, you always can count on U.S. to do random things. So from my point of view, and uh, you know, U.S. takes the lead in the global efforts against climate change or set a good example for China. Would be well, maybe well remember the case which is uh, do the random thing after exalting every other alternative. Whether it would be the case, and history will tell us. With this, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for a very, very fitting uh, quotation from Churchill. Uh, <laughs> it's been a stimulating but long day. I'm trying my best as a timekeeper to, to uh, end the session. Before I open the discussion, uh, a question from floor, I'd like just to offer a couple of comments. Now, this magazine was available on the table in the back. It says, how can the, can the world survive China's rush to emulate the American way of life? Well, I'd like to offer a slightly different question. Can the world survive the American way of life? It, it's, it's a very different question. In, in, the, in the debate of global countries today, China's energy use and emissions are becoming a very you know, key and controversial issue. But I like to keep people in perspective. This, this afternoon, Professor Smith showed a picture of rural household in China. And that's the reality is. The growth is strong, but its growth is from a very low base. In the countryside, probably the annual income of those families is under $1,000 a year. And the US is above $45,000. So, uh, and in, this is the same, you know, similar dif difference exists in per capita energy use and emissions. I'm using the per capita number not only to, not to say that China is off the hook, but to tell how big a challenge we have to going forward. Um, so with that, I first like to um, ask Mark a question. This 20% target sounds great and fantastic. And there's money thrown at this issue and there's political campaign pressure being put to use. But realistic, realistically speaking, does China has the manpower and the institutions and the mechanism to deliver on the 20% target? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think the importance of the 20% target is that China is, is uh, changing directions. Uh, I, I hope they don't take 2010 too seriously because otherwise many people I know are going to be out of jobs. Uh, I, I don't see any way that China can reach that target by 2010. Uh, 
the analysis, Jung, that you did, I think showed that if they had started a year earlier, uh, that they could have gotten halfway there with efficiency. Uh, I think they're thinking very seriously about uh, changing the growth of their super energy intensive industries. I think they find that uh, difficult to do. Uh, and this is like a super tanker that's barreling along uh, and uh, isn't going to be turned uh, around so quickly. Uh, in the meantime, China is promoting as much energy efficiency as it can. Uh, uh, it's remarkable the difference in the intensity of interest in energy uh, efficiency uh, in NDRC this year as compared with last year. Uh, China does have money, 2 billion RMB, uh, to, uh, to pay for closing uh, energy inefficient factories. That's a very uh, effective way, if you can do it politically, uh, of saving energy. But they're not going to, I don't see any way that they could possibly reach their goal. Nonetheless, uh, they're going to change directions. And that's the important thing. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I, I guess I agree with what Mark said, but I just want to add one point is, uh, you know, the, the government said this national target 20% for the, you know, for the five years, and I decomposed to the each year, and the last year, 2006, was requiring the 4% reductions. But in the end, in China, except Taiwan, there were 30 provinces. And only Beijing managed that target, that is 5.2% reduction. And the very close one is Tianjin, 397 And the rest of it doesn't, it's still far from it is here. I like, and one point on this issue, the record is also reached in this morning. When you have this kind of picture, usually you always see all the province, local, local are very bad guys, look like government, central government is a good guy. I like to particularly emphasize one point here is kind of coordination between the central and the local government. Except the people discussed this morning about this promotion criteria, I consider this a kind of subject, subject speaking that to some extent that is the reason. But I also like to see objectively speaking, central government also have a huge responsibility for these failures. I like to particularly emphasize China improper financial system is the key. Why I say so? In 1993, 1994, China adopted the kind of the tax, new, new tax sharing system. Basically means all this kind of tax easily to collect larger base and, and state resources, state revenues, all collected by central government. What happened is that is in the 2000, in the 1994, that you see the central government revenue doubled compared to 1993. But in the meantime, the central government consumption, which is as a percentage of total government consumption, only increased two point. To that sense, you to sometimes leave the local government no choice by to develop GDP, have a larger tax base to prom, to to use for their you know for the for the for the purpose. Another thing is particularly to energy issues. I also like to see that what is the improper tax system in China is so-called differ, differentiation tariff, basically what they say is the uh, government list nine sectors. If you're in these nine sectors, they will charge them per unit of kilo hours more than the other sectors. Th then, the, oh, the, in the end, this look like is we will favorable to cut the energy use for this, this you know, discouraged sectors. But in the end, the implementing result fund is uh, actually many provinces actually still you give the favorable tariff to this reason because the central government take all the revenue from this. So I, I would say appropriate tar tax system, tariff system, it means uh, government can set deflation tariff, charge additional more from the sectors, but the revenue from this kind of sector should back to local government, but require local government use revenue specifically for and receiving animal reductions. Thank you. Now I open the question from the floor. Okay, in the back. Uh, regarding the uh, energy intensity f figures uh, that have recently come out from the IEA, my understanding is that the Chinese government criticized uh, the latest estimates, um, but 
did not really explain why. Is it your understanding that the Chinese government substantively disagrees with the assessment that China has passed the United States, or is it uh, simply trying to downplay the whole issue? I was told by IEA folks, this is a reaction to the World Energy Outlook 2007, uh, that the Chinese government objected to the forecast, which showed that China and India combined uh, will represent 45 percent of uh, additional CO2 emissions between now and 2030. Uh, I, I don't... Uh, uh, I don't even remember anything in the report that uh, talks about their passing the U.S. I, I think it had to do with the forecast. And I don't know that it's substantive. You know, they just didn't like it featured. May I just add one uh, comment to that? I, I think it's an, people object to that um, description uh, in, because it's not a very good indicator of the situation. I mean, it's a very insulting in many ways to characterize China as the global biggest polluter, considering the per capita issue is totally ignored. Earlier, uh, Max mentioned that, you know, this question, how do we engage developing nations uh, to, on climate change? Uh, well, that was principle greed in the 92 uh, real summit. It was clear. Uh, the developed nations has contributed historically greater deal to the problem and should take the leadership moving forward to demonstrate it is technically feasible as well as financially viable to do this. And then you can transfer the technology and help the developing nation coming along to deal with this problem. And none of the three commitments have been met so far. So to many people in the developing world, by highlighting the total numbers of emissions for particular developing countries is a way of shifting responsibility away. The spotlight should be focused on those countries who has failed to step up to its own role. May I say something? I'm not sure if I'm hitting the right button here. I mean, this is, this is an, an old argument that, that we've we've heard for, you know, 15, 15 years or, or, or longer than that and underlies the, the ultimate fact that, that Kyoto didn't bite as much as, as we wanted it to originally. And, and clearly sitting here uh, as a half American, it's, it's always hard to come up with these, these uh, scenarios for new global climate policy when I'm a 50% citizen of a country that, that hasn't ratified the Agreement. And I think the important point here is to realize what, maybe from an from a equity or historical perspective, you're, you're fully correct in, in your assessment here. Also from an equity perspective, you're fully correct. But going forward, if we're looking at the aggregate global trajectory, if you look at the rates of growth, uh, the problem is a lot of the additional marginal carbon comes from developing countries. Now, the idea isn't the debate will certainly be over who's going to pay for it, but I think the more fundamental question is how are we jointly going to get these sources to, to reduce emissions? If we put in a power plant today, that's going to sit around for 50-something years. If we put in a significantly more efficient power plant, the same amount of power coming out of it, uh, the, the trajectory of emissions from that power plant is going to be a significantly different one. So I'm I think there has to be a, a, a recognition of the issue, but a shift in the debate of, of how we approach this, this issue. A global carbon tax, when we make it revenue neutral, there's nothing to say that there couldn't be a, a massive income transfer from developed countries to, to developing countries. But reductions have to come from both sources. Gentlemen in the back. Uh, in that regard, um, what is the um, current thinking and, and discussions in China on uh, CO2 capture and sequestration? Um, Mark, I guess. Uh, yeah, is this same as here. Uh, they're working on it. They're doing R&D. 
and a lot of people are praying that it's going to work uh, and that it will work in large scale and that it will work fairly soon. Uh, I think the large scale and fairly soon, uh, uh, we don't see signs of it yet. But, uh, you know, that's a big hope. In fact, there are now uh, end of pipe technologies for removing CO2 from uh, power plants. Uh, so that one could imagine taking the CO2 from the coal-based uh, uh, burning power plants in China and uh, capturing them and, and, uh, and sequestering them. So that's, you know, a lot of people hope that's going to work. The question is, is it really being taken seriously at high levels and the Chinese government has an option that might be moved into, say, in five or ten years? Oh, in five or ten years? Uh, I, I don't know. I can tell you, I, I did attend a meeting with the, with the head of the uh, Ministry of Science and Technology and a senior official from the, from the U.S. government, and that was the, the highest interest topic in the meeting. I, I just like to what the quick question on these issues. It is, uh, you know, the carbon capture and the storage certainly is an issue which are relevant to the United States, also China, because basically our two countries, which, you know, use coal, large, you know, China uses much more U.S., but the U.S. also half of electricity produced by, the, by, by coal. And I recently, actually, I see the presentation by U.S. DOE, and uh, if I look, look at the numbers about the cost, even for the United States, United States, probably at least need more than 10 years to get that cost down. So I guess probably for China, it would be take even longer. But certainly that is an option which China look at very seriously. Because we don't have much option, you know, to, because the coal is still there. And uh, oil gas, you know, is uh, China increase use, and they already have many political and geopolitical issues. Certainly is uh, how to use clean coal in the meantime, you know, have the capture options. Certainly is the issue which, you know, Consider very seriously. Professor Chiang? I just have uh, some I just want to uh, add on to back to the issue of the debate on the uh, climate change and the responsibilities. I think it's very important uh, uh, to realize and uh, have a clear consensus globally where the responsibilities lie because the advanced industrialized countries now have this line, well, not all of them, United States, Canada, plus Japan, that's all what it, it is coming out of Bali in the past couple of days. Uh, one line is basically saying, well, historically there was a problem. We, we didn't know it was wrong, but the mistakes were made. Now we know, so China shouldn't be wrong, India shouldn't be wrong again. Good argument, move forward, okay? I think that should carry, I think the Chinese would accept that. But the issue now is who is paying for what? I think you raise a good question. If the responsibility historically lying in advanced industrialized countries, they should pay for most, of, for most of them. And the Chinese and the Indians and other developing countries, they're at the stage they still wanted to have a better life. You can't say the Chinese cannot develop their own recent living, their living standards when we drive SUVs around and consuming seven times more energy and then go around and tell the Chinese they can't do it or the Indians they should change their own lifestyle. Why don't we lower our own lifestyle to the emission standard to the Chinese and the Indians and then begin to lecture them? So that's the problem you need to convince within India, China, Brazil and other countries that they need to be uh, carrying up some kind of responsible policies. It's one thing for the Chinese to say, we realize if we continue to do this, we're going to be getting nowhere. And you need to do it, China needs to do it, India needs to do it for their own sake, of their own people. I think it's one thing for them to say that, it's quite another for us to say, you, you began to do this and you're the big polluters and on that. So the issue now, we're looking at US, supported by US, by Japan and Canada, at Bali are saying what China used to say, we cannot, develop climate control targets at the, at the expense of economic development. 
China actually abandoned that by saying more respons responsibilities, and US and Canada and Japan, the trail, miners, actually Australia, are saying that in Bali. Basically, the kind of argument saying, we cannot develop any hard targets at the expense of economic growth. And that's advanced industrialized countries. So the issue now is, how can you persuade the domestic dynamics, say China, that the debate is still going on, they say, we're not responsible, we don't pay for it. And there's still people who say, well, now there's a strong scientific development concept developing, but there are others who are saying, gee, develop first, pollute first, fix later. Other countries done that, we can do that too. There are other countries, more nationalistic wing in China are still saying, China becomes strong global power first, to be competing with the United States, and then we fix the environment issues later. We cannot sacrifice national prestige, national power as a great power to compete in order to fix the environment, basically taking the burdens of advanced industrialized countries. So what our attitude in advanced industrialized countries now have, having a bearing on the internal debate of where China is going. That's very important. We need to realize that the dynamics internally, although there's commitment, but there's continuous debate, not everybody is on board. And if advanced industrialized countries can help, and then we can enhance the reform-oriented minded in China for the policy formation towards the direction we like them to do. Sorry, it's been a bit long a comment. Can I, so I would like to tell you that. Can I say something? Sure. So uh, I think that's a, a really extremely valid point, and, and I by no means think that, that we shouldn't do anything being in California. You know, the drive to really dr drastically drive down carbon emissions here has been uh, unprecedented for, for a U.S. state. But I came across this really interesting, actually, Richard Carson gave me this uh, survey that, that came out yesterday or two days ago from PIPA Globescan, and they asked people across the country, uh, uh, across the world, would you favor or oppose raising taxes on the types of energy such as coal, oil, petrol that most cause climate change in order to encourage individuals and businesses to use less of these? So Germany, 17% strongly favor, 43% somewhat favor. Uh, Great Britain, 20% strongly favor, 34% somewhat favor. China, 50% strongly favor, 35%. Uh, somewhat favor. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to look at what the sampling frame is here, but as a, as a little beacon of, of uh, positive note that we could maybe end this on is, sorry? Oh, you want to know the US too? 20% strongly favor, 26% somewhat favor. So, uh, yeah. Okay, Harrison? Yeah. So, you know, I think the, the best, what I've heard today, is we can spend a lot of time looking at history and who's at fault. The, the biggest thing we need to do is try to figure out what's the smartest, most strategic way to move forward. And it seems to me what we need to have are models that demonstrate that you can have very, very high en energy efficiency, very low carbon emissions, and you're producing a better quality of life in doing that. And it's a better economic model than we develop first and clean up afterwards. And that's the leapfrogging thing that I think China has the opportunity to show the world, as does India and other places. And we're the ones who are going to have to come back and learn from the models that China can put forward. And I think they exist. And um, China has the leadership and even the recognition at the local level that they should be doing that. Just look at your poll. And so that's what we, I think, should be mapping out are those future strategies um, and sort of get away from, um, you know, this debate about who's responsible and who pays. China can be even a better economic power, I think, if they follow certain sustainability strategies. It's a, it's, a, it's a double win for them. And that's what we should be looking at. Well, thank you, Harrison, for that positive perspective. I think we actually should, don't, we can't feel too depressed because just as um, Dr. Zhang's slide shows, China is actually moving in that right direction. It sets fuel economy standards that's much tighter than the US. And then yesterday was a landmark decision in the US Congress to pass, raise the fuel economy to 35 miles per gallon by 2020. 
China by next year has a you know, 36 pound per gallon. So it is moving in the right direction. And it has a renewable energy target, uh, 15 or 16 percent by 2020. The U.S. probably likely to scrap that. So, so China is moving to down the roads we like them to go. And so with that, I know our time is running out. And uh, thank you for everyone.